All righty. Hey, guys. Uh, so if your dog has seizures, paralysis, intervertebral disc disease, balance problems, degenerative myelopathy, difficulty walking, uh, that's what we're here to answer for you. I, I've got Dr. Christine Seneca, a neurologist at our Southeast Veterinary Neurology of Jupiter location, and I'm Dr. Wong, uh, here to answer your questions. So um, if you've got questions, please put them in the comments. Um, if you are watching this on the replay, please, 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 please email your questions to Q&A at SEV, like Southeast Veterinary, uh, then the whole word neurology.com. Please don't call the office if you're, if you're just looking to have your question answered. If you're looking for a consultation and want us to evaluate your pet, absolutely call one of our offices. Um, so put your questions in the comments. Um, and uh, Dr. Seneca and I will, will get to the questions now. Hi, Denise, I can see you and it says that you're connected. Oh, it says you're connected to audio. Perfect. Yes, Hello. I am. Hi. Can you hear me? You can. Okay, good. So, uh, Denise, are you able to flip your phone to go to, oh, no, you're talking to me. Yes. Perfect. So, so, so <laughs> tell us about Bing and uh, where, where, you're, where, you're, where you're located and what your question about okay. Bing is. So Bing is, uh, will be 13 years old next week. Um, in January, he had his first grand mal seizure while we were in California. Um, he followed that with another grand mal seizure toward the end of February. We brought him to a neurologist in California and decided to have an MRI done. Uh, the MRI found a um, uh, olfactory right side meningioma, cystic, I guess, meningioma. And we didn't start him on pre uh, phenobarbital until the end of March after his third grand mal seizure. Um, the phenobarbital was very hard on him. We tried it for three weeks, and at the end of the three weeks, he could not stand up, and he couldn't go to the bathroom by phenobarbital, and we put him on 750 milligrams. He's been on that since about the middle of April, full-time, and has not had any more seizures. Um, we've since moved from California to Massachusetts, and we've checked in with a different a uh, neurologist who agreed with the MRI findings. Her neurological exam found some weaknesses on his, I believe I, it's, his, it's the opposite side that you would have expected to see it on, the right side. So what we're seeing now is seizures, which I think is primarily Sorry, important. Can you say that again? But I'm starting to see some um, in that Sometimes he doesn't know where to go when it's confused in him. And I see that by standing still and not moving if I'm walking somewhere or if it's time to eat, I put a bowl in front of him and he's not sure what to do. Um, I'm also seeing some, what I, I've called confusion in his hind end, where if he tries to go up steps, he will often cross his legs and just collapse. Um, what else is, oh, and if he just stands while I'm petting him, if you look at his legs, sometimes his legs are, his back legs are crossed. So those are the types of things we're seeing. We are seeing him in the evening when we're sitting down, um, kind of going into a back room and just laying down instead of being in the area where we are. And those are things that are all different from what his, what I would call his normal behavior is. Other than that, I'd say he's a pretty healthy 13 year old guy. He is also deaf, by the way. He lost his hearing in October. Okay. Oh, is that him right there? There you go. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, oh, I, I just was going to say, we were not there, obviously, when the Massachusetts vet did her neurological exam. Um, she did describe him as very calm, which is not typically how I would have described him. But um, that's kind of one of the things we've seen as well. He's just slowing down a little bit and um yeah yeah i guess it is i don't know i hate i hate to see it i'm thankful that he's not having any seizures though for sure so i, I guess my question would be what can we expect 
um, we are not treating the meningioma. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's really good that he's doing as well as he is on, on Keppra. Um, you know, some, some dogs have a, a great response, um, just like Bing is having, and you know, some dogs um, have a very good response in the beginning, but then after some time, they may have, have less of a um, control with their seizure activity. So just kind of going back to the original diagnosis, uh, a tumor in the right olfactory um, or frontal lobe, um, that's kind of the very front part of, of the brain, kind of right, right behind the sinus. Um, and so it tends to actually be a little bit of a silent area of the brain, um, so which is why we tend not to even find these until dogs are even are having seizure activity. So some of the things that you're describing um, don't make quite a lot of sense, you know, especially the crisscrossing the back legs. You know, that's just not something we typically see with um, what we call a forebrain tumor in dogs. So a proprioceptive deficit, you know, when they take the paws and they kind of turn them upside down on the ground, which I'm sure um, both neurologists have done, and then correcting that, um, we can definitely see those, those deficits uh, with brain tumors in dogs. However, as you said, we would expect that to be kind of on, on the opposite side of where that tumor is. So, so my question now, if you are seeing it on the same or what we call ipsilateral side as the tumor, is it because we have uh, potentially growth of that tumor? Um, are we now affecting the other side of the, of the brain? Is there potentially some brain swelling? Because, um, you know, this was done back in March, so now we're kind of several months down the road here. So have we had growth? Sometimes these tumors um, can kind of sit dormant for a little while and then, and then grow a little bit more exponentially. Um, so, so my question is, are we affecting the other side of the brain from the tumor, or are we dealing with something entirely different, potentially even in his, in his spinal cord? Um, and so when uh, we had gotten your question, there was a report of him having that deficit in, in the front leg as well. Um, and so that would make us worried, is there something actually going on in the neck? Um, and we can see dogs be a bit worse in the, in the back legs compared to the front. So, you know, is that directly related to the tumor? Is it, is it something else, you know, to answer your question about you know, what can we expect if, if we're just dealing with the, the meningioma, um, these tend to be fairly slowly growing tumors. Um, you know, how long was it there before we, you got it diagnosed? That's hard to say, it's, it's very impossible to know that. Um, so considering he's doing as well as he is, you know, this many months down the road, I, I think, you know, I think that's really, really positive. Um, but the expectation is going to be that, that that will grow. So without any sort of surgical intervention or radiation therapy, uh, there is nothing stopping it from growing. So over time, you will start to see things like more seizures despite medications. Uh, you will probably start to see more kind of behavioral changes, uh, more of that kind of quiet demeanor um, that's, that's not typical for him. Um, the visual changes, again, that where this tumor is, um, it doesn't quite fit uh, with, with what we would expect. We wouldn't really expect a, a visual deficit, uh, considering where that is. Dr. Wong, if you have any other thoughts, let me know. But that's, that's a little bit strange to me that he may not be, you know, kind of seeing his food. So is it truly a visual deficit or is it more of um, kind of understanding and processing of, of where that food is? That's kind of what I think. Yeah, that was my thought process as well. Is, is, it, is it not so much that he's not seeing it, but he's not acting appropriately or, you know, putting it all together? So, I, you know, I think going forward, it's, it's very hard to put a, a time frame on things. Um, you know, seeing him in, in the backyard there with you, he, he, looks, he looks really happy and really content. And I think that's, you know, that's the goal for all of us and the goal for him is to, is to have as long of a great quality of life as is possible. And when you start noticing those other changes, you know, when he's not wanting to, to get up and, and be outside and, you know, if seizures are starting to occur with a lot of frequency, you know, obviously the phenobarbital didn't, um, didn't do great things for him. And, and that is a drug where, you know, sometimes the older dogs can be a little bit more sensitive to it. Um, there are other options, you know, so if seizures become more and more frequent, we may need to consider something else for, for control if, you know, if, if the rest of him is still doing okay. And, and, and I didn't read it here, and I, I didn't catch you saying it, but have, 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 we, have we tried anything like, like prednisone at any point, whether it was early on with the seizures or whether it's been more recent with the behavior change and the, the slipping out and, and 
the other symptoms you're you're recognizing? The, the neurologist said that's the next thing in the arsenal. So if he continues to deteriorate, then we would add the uh, steroid. So that would be the next step. Yeah, and, and, and so adding steroids isn't necessarily going to tell us has the tumor grown and it's not going to tell us is this all because of the original tumor or is there a new problem somewhere else in his nervous system um but you know outside of doing more mris and things like that which i completely get of, of not doing it, it's certainly reasonable to try prednisone i think as long as you and you know pet parents understand lots of things can respond to prednisone. It doesn't necessarily tell us why we're responding, what the cause is. It doesn't really give more, that doesn't answer all the questions you've got here of what does it mean for him long-term, but many times it can just, just help. Yeah, so that, that would be the next step. So, and then, and we would consider a second MRI, but I don't know that that, if we're not treating the meningioma, I'm not sure that there's value added to a second MRI. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's good information to have. It's, it's good for, you know, kind of closure of, you know, where are we at now and we expect things. But again, we, we want to treat the dog and not the picture um, at this point. And, you know, even if that tumor has grown two or three times the size, if, if he's still you know, doing what he's doing in front of you there, um, that doesn't necessarily change what we would recommend as far as, you know, treating him. And, you know, I do think prednisone is probably a a good option getting some blood work just to make sure that you know his, his organs are in good shape to, to tolerate being on some steroids um but he he looks pretty happy there okay you guys well thank you you got it i appreciate your time very much sure thing. Happy birthday, enjoy, enjoy fall in the northeast i'm from up there so enjoy it it's going to be really pretty it's, it'll be our first fall up here so we're looking forward to it <laughs> good thank you all right. Bye, Denise. Bye, Bye. Bye. All right. I'm going to turn off. Bye-bye. Uh, so the, the, we've got a couple questions here that are kind of asking, um, for dogs with epilepsy, are there any particular diets that you recommend or any sort of dietary uh, changes that, that you recommend? So, I mean, recently there's been, you know, the literature that's come out about medium chain triglycerides that these could potentially help with epileptic patients. Um, I certainly have uh, you know, talk to clients about, you know, potentially starting the Purina NeuroCare diet, uh, which is high in those medium chain triglycerides. Uh, personally, I can't say that I've um, seen changes, and that's probably just because they haven't had that diet long enough. You know, these are dietary changes are not expected to make um, a difference immediately. You know, these are something, something that we have to be very patient with to see. Um, other than that, Personally, I can't say that I have any preferences or recommendations for, for diets. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we, we, we kind of get this question frequently, it, it, you know, probably every, every week or every other week. Um, so j just like what you said, that, that's the one that kind of has the most uh, backing to it. But with regards to, you know, ketogenic diets or gluten-free diets or grain-free diets or anything like that, we, we just don't have the... Um, I guess the, the evidence, and I, I'm kind of of the, the same opinion as, as you with the uh, Purina diet or the, 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 the medium chain triglycerides, just, you know, it's, it's hard to gauge personally because we're using that in addition to all of the other therapies. So, you know, even, even Purina will say, this is not to replace uh, regular therapy of medications, it's in conjunction. So that's kind of what makes it challenging for me uh, to just sort of look and, you know, okay, I've got this dog on three different medications and now I added the food. Is there a dramatic change? You know, no, but we're, we're often looking at the, the hardest to control. Yeah. And it's also, you know, that diet, at least in their studies, was used for, <laughs> for epileptic patients, not in dogs that had structural brain disease. So, you know, tumors and meningitis, uh, they weren't looking at those cases. Um, but, it, you know, again, it, it, like a lot of things, it, to me, um, that kind of adjunct therapy is not going to hurt the patient. And if we can get any benefit out of it, you know, I, I think it's reasonable. Okay. Um, I, I guess I, I did want to throw it out one more time um, for those of you that may just be, be popping in right now. Doc, Dr. Seneca, as she 
alluded to when we were talking to Denise. Uh, she's recently moved from the Northeast, but now she's at our, our brand new Jupiter location. So, um, and, Florida. <laughs> yes, I, when, when I was up there last time, it was evident how, how uh, happy you were to be in a warm, sunshiny place. Uh, if, you, if, if you're in South Florida and you're not what I consider South Florida of, of Miami and you're a little further north, uh, Dr. Seneca is very, very, very available um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in our, our Jupiter office. Um, so going back to questions, we just got another one in. Uh, best emergency medications. Um, so I, I assume they're talking about for, for status epilepticus for dogs with seizures and uh, their particular question is, is nasal administration as effective as, as rectal? So I guess you can probably talk about just in general, um, you know, status epilepticus, cluster seizures, what you recommend at home, when you recommend coming into the hospital, and kind of talk about rectal versus intranasal and diazepam versus midazolam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think almost always we're, we're recommending animals come in, right? So if, if you have a seizure patient and, you know, your dog has, you know, two to three seizures in a, in a short period of time, you know, we're always recommending those patients come in because the likelihood is we're going to get better control uh, with intravenous medications. But um, if you are home and, you know, it's, it's going to take a bit to, to get them in, um, you know, intranasal midazolam has been shown to be just as effective um, with how quickly it can um, get into their system. Um, and there are these little diffusers that you can attach to the tip of a syringe to to help kind of get it into the nose properly rather than just dripping it in. Um, rectal diazepam suppositories, I've had some patients, some clients that love them and, and some that don't. I think the trouble with the rectal administration is, you know, getting that medication in far enough to let it absorb. And a lot of these are formulated with a kind of um, wax capsule, um, and that takes time to, to kind of break down and dissolve. Um, I have seen, I've, ha I've known of compounding pharmacies that will put it in more of a gel form that stays a bit more stable um, and can be absorbed more quickly. Um, again, I've only had a few patients with that. You know, it, it's, I guess, my personal experience is clients are just so worried about their dog and so nervous, they're, they're getting them into the hospital. Um, the other thing to really keep in mind with, you know, intranasal midazolam is if you, you know, are keeping anything in that syringe, we do worry about that drug actually kind of binding to the plastic to the syringe. So if it's kept in there for an extended period of time before it's used, you know, if they're kind of pre-drawn syringes, it may not work as, as well. The diazepam. Yeah. So, so I guess for the, for the veterinarians that, that are watching, and I think the, the question may have come from a, a veterinarian or an emergency veterinarian. I guess, do you have a, a strong preference of one over the other? And I guess, which would you, sure, the, the recommendation should be, you know, two, three seizures in a 24 hour period or a seizure that lasts longer than, you know, I know everyone kind of has their own, whether it's three minutes, four minutes, that's when we should go into the emergency clinic. But um, I guess for the veterinarians that are watching for them to give recommendations to their client, um, I, I guess, do you have a strong preference of, of one over the other? The Midazolam. I, I think I would, you know, prefer midazolam internasally um, with the diffuser if, if they can get it. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of what I run into the most is, you know, the, many veterinarians aren't, aren't aware of, you know, midazolam intranasally. I, I think at least when I went through school, it was, you know, rectal valium you know, or intranasal valium. So I, I think that's still new to some veterinarians of the intranasal midazolam. Okay. Yeah, I, I think our, our 120 says she's going to be a little late, so we'll do a couple more questions. Um, uh, Marguerite says, can you give the rabies vaccine to a dachshund with occasional seizures, and should I pre-treat with Benadryl? Uh, so as long as, you know, it sounds like your dachshund does not have meningitis. That would be my only kind of big concern with vaccinating. Um, we, you know, um, but if this is epilepsy, there's really um, no reason you cannot vaccinate your dog. Um, and giving Benadryl, um, you know, really is more for 
the kind of um, allergic reactions of facial swelling and hives and things like that and wouldn't be expected to to from any sort of seizure activity. But um, if the dog has been vaccinated in the past without any issue, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it causing a problem um, in a dog with epilepsy. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm the same way. I mean, really the only time that we're, we're talking about, I guess that I, I talk about vaccinations and seizures is, is like you said, in dogs that have inflammatory brain disease where you know, some, not all of them may, may relapse with, with that immune stimulation. So the, the, the question kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. So, so Melanie says, I, I tried to get the nasal midazolam here in Kansas and was told by every pharmacy it would be around $600 um, when I do see others that get it far cheaper. So I, I, I don't know off the top of my head of you know, w w which pharmacies are, are uh, more expensive or less expensive. Um, most of the time we'll actually prescribe the um, the intranasal lidazolam through through the hospital, um, so we don't off, often prescribe it through the through the pharmacy. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where in Kansas. I, I guess I would ask ask veterinarians. Um, I, I would ask on on the online forums that I, I assume you're, you're on, Melanie. If you're finding this, um, I, I don't have a whole lot to offer with with regards to where to find it less expensive. So. Um, Sharon, I, I see that you've, you've put a couple questions on, on here, um, and, and you're asking about your 10-month-old dachshund's eyesight, um, and, and will it get better? Uh, can you give me a little bit more information about uh, what, what's going on if, if it's, what, what, what's going on with your dachshund's vision? All right, just while we wait for, for Jody to get here. Seven synapse uh, for veterinarians that are wa watching this October 4th. Uh, we're, we're, it's five hours of CE Sunday, October 4th um, that we'll be, we'll be giving. If you email uh, to Q&A at sevneurology.com, they can give you all of the information for that. I can touch back on the intranasal versus rectal sure. administration. The other thing, you know, with, with rectal diazepam is you have to give a lot. Um, the dose is actually quite a bit higher than an intravenous. And so I, that's another reason why it tends to be less, uh, I don't know what the right word is, less favored <laughs> than, than yeah. the intravenous. I, 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 I agree completely. I mean, kind of in, in, in my schooling, that's what it was that, you know, we gave uh, rectal Valium and then kind of through my residency, that's still what we would talk about, but just Practically, it wasn't very useful for all the reasons that you said. You know, one, we're sending a controlled, controlled drug home that's you know in an injectable form. Two, when we put it in plastic, you know, it it binds to to it. Uh, we we wouldn't actually be able to send something home from the hospital. Uh, the Valium suppositories, the diastat, just that was always really really expensive for clients to get, um, and. You kind of talked about the the, the compounded gel. Um, at, at least, you know, a, a long time ago, I wasn't as uh, confident of of what was actually, you know, in in the compounded uh, compounded gel for for rectal suppositories. So, um, I always, when clients would ask about it, you know, I would give them that those sorts of options. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, give you the prescription for this. It's going to be more. Um, or I can give you the prescription for a, a, a gel, um, but I don't know necessarily what it's going to do. Yeah. So what its efficacy will be. So uh, Jody is here. Hello. Hello. I think she's still, there you are, you're connected. <laughs> Hi Jody, can you hear us? Hi. <laughs> I, I, it sounds like you've got a pack in the back there. What's that? I do. I have two of them. Okay. So you've got Maximus, uh, a six-year-old French bulldog? Yes. Okay. What's going on with Maximus? Um, well, he has had worsening spinal weakness and um, has started to become incontinent lately. And he was diagnosed with um, SAD, I believe it's called. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. 
So, so what, how did his symptoms, um, how did his symptoms come on? Like what were his initial symptoms? How long have they been going on? Did they it come on suddenly or slowly? It was really slowly. It started with him just his, one of his back legs would slide out occasionally on the floor. Um, and then it started progressing to um, just more issues with his hind end, just kind of wobbliness. Okay. But never any pain or anything. And uh, somebody told me that it might be a hip issue, like hip dysplasia. And so when we got that checked out, that's when the vet mentioned the possibility of IVDD sure. and said it was something neurological. Um, so when we um, pursued that, he did a CT with myelogram and that showed a worse spinal issue that he understood really. And he didn't think surgery was um, would have been beneficial because we were going to go right into surgery after that. Um, and since then, I have seen another neurologist in the area to get a second opinion, and she agreed with the um, the spinal compression that is more complicated and doesn't really have a good surgical fix. So um, I, I guess there are a couple things to, 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 to chat about here. I mean, one one point to make that um, I guess is less for you, but is for other people that are watching right now is, um, you know, lots of things can look the same as a slipped disc. So if you told me six year old French bulldog with rear limb weakness, yeah, the most common thing that we see that can cause weakness and wobbliness in, in the rear limbs is a slipped disc. But there are other things as you found out, things like meningitis, myelitis, or inflammation of the spinal cord, things like uh, tumors, even in a six-year-old French bulldog, occasionally we see tumors. Things like degenerative myelopathy, we usually see in kind of older large breed dogs. Um, things like spinal cord strokes, and then occasionally we can see a, a, a malformation. Um, certain malformations are more bone related, certain malformations are more spinal cord related, um, it sounds like what you're describing of a, um, th there are actually lots of different terms that we use to, uh, to, to name this condition, but um, mm -hmm. subarachnoid diverticulum or spinal, mm -hmm. arachnoid, spinal arachnoid diverticulum. Um, so those are the same thing, essentially? <clears throat> so th th there, there isn't a... I guess a consensus on on what exactly we're we're calling it. Some people call this pug myelopathy, and that it's mm -hmm. most common in pugs. Uh, one of the earlier papers that came out on the the condition called it um, facet hypoplasia, um, mm -hmm. mainly seeing the the bony abnormalities. Mm -hmm. I, I I I think the reality is that we don't really know exactly what causes it. So it's. Um, I don't know what's been explained to you, but it's a, we, we see this fluid pocket or fluid dilation in the space surrounding the spinal cord that normally has fluid in it. So the subarachnoid space, is that him? Is that Maximus? Yeah, he's lining at my feet, so. <laughs> so <laughs> hey, Maximus. So. I, I, have you seen the CAT scan? Has anybody shown you it? Or? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I, I couldn't really tell what I was even looking at on it. Sure. So, so the, the spinal cord is kind of surrounded by, by fluid or cerebrospinal fluid, uh, CSF. Mm -hmm. And in this condition, one of the, the things that we see on the imaging, whether it's a CAT scan myelogram or whether it's an MRI, we'll see kind of this pocket of fluid in that space that fluid normally is, but it's it's just mm -hmm. dilated. It's much bigger. Instead of this real thin area, it's kind of this big pocket that presses on the spinal cord. And the classic symptoms that we see, it's usually older pugs, but probably the number two condi the number two breed that we see it in is, is a French bulldog. We just commonly see it in the squishy face breeds. I, I've mm -hmm. seen it in a handful of English bulldogs, and a handful of Boston Terriers. And usually these dogs aren't painful. Usually it's kind of this insidious onset, like you said, it kind of comes on slowly and progressively. Mm -hmm. Many times they have urinary or more commonly fecal incontinence, like you've described with Maximus, where it's not so much that he doesn't know and he's always having accidents and he can't poop, but more mm -hmm. often what I, what I hear is 
they they know they need to go, but they can't hold it long enough to get outside. Mm -hmm. So many times it's, I gotta go, uh, I'm at the front door waiting to go out, but I can't hold it long enough. Yeah, he, he actually will go in his sleep sometimes and yep. it wakes him up and he acts surprised, like he doesn't, didn't even know it was happening. And um, so that's been like the newest struggle. We, we, we don't know exactly why it happens and, and it's likely multifactorial. So mm -hmm. there's, there, there's likely a genetic, uh, genetic factor since we see it in certain breeds, there's likely a genetic factor. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes what we find at surgery or if you know, the patient passes away and gets an autopsy or if there's a biopsy, um, we, we just find for lack of a better term, a, a, a scar tissue at the, around the spinal cord that kind of, I don't know if it blocks the, the flow of the fluid or if it just changes the, the dynamics of the fluid flow. So instead of that CSF kind of running in a nice, like a nice trickling stream, it becomes more turbulent, like a, a you know, a, a, a whitewater rapids or whatnot. So we, we don't really know exactly what happens there. Many times there's also just instability. So at surgery or on the imaging, we can see there's oftentimes a mild disc bulge there. And sometimes there's new bone formation, what we call spondylosis deformans, mm -hmm. suggesting that maybe there's a degree of instability there. And some people feel that it's that chronic instability that causes irritation that leads to this the scar tissue or, or fibrous tissue building up. Again, we, we don't know. A lot of these are theories. Yeah. Um, similarly, there, there isn't a consensus on the best way to, to, treat, uh, to treat this condition. Mm -hmm. um, in general, dogs that I've treated with medications or physical therapy or acupuncture or just rest. Mm -hmm. I don't see them get better and they do continue to get worse, but it's usually a slow decline. So it's not that they go like our slip disc dogs where they're walking one day and they're paralyzed the next. So yeah. we usually don't see that sort of thing, but it does get worse over time. So for, for quite some time, I've, I've tended to recommend surgery for this condition. Um, but it's not like a, a slipped disc where lots of people do it and we do it every single day and, you know, we mm -hmm. quote a 95% chance that we're going to fix things. I, I'm much more um, conservative in the prognosis that I give. One, for it helping, and two, for the long-term prognosis. Okay. There, um, the, 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 the surgery that's, that uh, I do is similar to a slip disc surgery in that we make a window in the bone called a, a hemilaminectomy or sometimes a dorsal laminectomy. And I often, or I, I always uh, do a, a procedure called a durotomy so that we can get to where that scar tissue is and sort of break it down. So it's, it's a little bit more invasive than a regular slip disc surgery. So it carries a little bit more risk um, and it's a little bit more challenging. The other part mm -hmm. of the surgery, for me at least, and you know, when I talk with other neurologists, not, not everybody does it this way, but I, I tend to stabilize the bones of the back just because I feel that there is that micro trauma or that micro instability. So part of the treatment for me is stabilization. Mm -hmm. Again, there's no consensus. So if you ask you know, 10 more neurologists, you'll probably get you know, at least seven different different opinions on it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, some, some people, you know, also talk about doing something called marsupializing. So that kind of covering of the spinal cord is pretty, pretty firm. And once it's opened, you can potentially kind of tack those edges back down to itself. So, you know, it's, it's very kind of fine work. And that the, the goal of that is to prevent it from really filling up again. Um, but the question is, you know, will it, will the body still put down more scar tissue? And, Mm -hmm. and I, I think that's what we see. So with this surgery, with this type of surgery, is it to um, delay progression of the symptoms with the mobility and the incontinence or um, is it 
really not going to do very much for them. Because what I'm wondering, um, compared to IVDD, because IVDD seems much more prevalent and people seem much more aware of it and what happens with it, but with Max, he has never had any pain and that was kind of the big difference I noticed. Everyone that talks about IVDD says pain is the number one thing they see and since he hasn't had that and he is still mobile um, and it's the incontinence that's the issue but as far as quality of life, his quality of life is still really good. So I'm just trying to weigh the risks and pros if surgery was done, could it really improve his life very much or not likely? Yeah, and, and again, I think this is where you'll you'll get, you know, di different uh, opinions. Kind mm -hmm. of my talk on this, uh, s some of it depends on, I don't think anybody knows the prognostic indicators of which dogs are going to do well and which dogs are not going to respond um, mm -hmm. to, to surgery. I, I, I do think um, for me, the duration of the symptoms in general dogs that I've operated sooner have had a better long-term outcome. And then the size of that dilation, uh, my opinion, and, and that's all it is, is the, the ones that I've seen that have had a bigger pocket tend to do better with surgery and tend to respond faster and stay better longer. Mm -hmm. Most of these dogs I set my, my, my clients up that most of them are going to look worse temporarily after surgery, just because of the nature of the surgery and the manipulation and going through those protective, um, protective coverings of the dura. Mm -hmm. Most patients look worse immediately post-operative. So a dog like Max, it's walking, but he's wobbly. You know, many times they're not walking the day after mm -hmm. surgery. And, um, but usually by the time they go home again for, for my personal experience, usually by the time they go home, they're they're walking um, and they're kind of back to where they were before. Um, obviously, the hope in us doing any any surgery is to make something better. Um, yeah. So that's our goal. But I set up clients um, that there's the potential that yeah, all that happens is we stop progression, um, and it's hard to prove that. In, in a dog of, well, gosh, what would have happened in, in Max in particular if we didn't do anything mm -hmm. versus if we did surgery? Um, so what I can tell you is most dogs that I don't operate on and I follow them, I do see them get worse. Some dogs that we operate on, we follow them and they still get worse. Some dogs we operate, um, they get better and stay better. And some dogs that we oper operate on, they get better and then a year or two down the line, they start showing symptoms again. And that's probably because what Dr. Seneca was saying is, well, does the scar tissue just come back and, and we get that, that pocket again? That's one of the reasons that, that I tend to stabilize these because I, I, I hope that it causes less uh, instability and less new scar tissue formation. Um, but Another important the question, thing. Sorry, go ahead. You finish. Uh, the, the, the question that, that you had is the question that literally every every owner has is, you know, well, gosh, he, he, he looks pretty good right now. You know, it's not terrible. I, I would do it if there was a guarantee that it was going to fix everything, but I don't want to put him through something if it's going to be the same, and I don't want to put him through something if it's going to get worse. And th that to me is the challenge uh, for us coaching, for us coaching parents. Um, yeah. I guess one of the challenges that, that I see is many times for me, at least it's older, older pugs. So, you know, s s uh, Max being six years old, you know, that would be one thing that would sort of tilt the scale towards considering surgery. Again, I'm not making that recommendation. I can't make that recommendation without seeing him, without looking at the CT myelogram, et cetera. But mm -hmm. age is one of the other things that I factor in. If it's that 13 year old pug, it's a lot harder for me to, you know, if it were my pet, say, yes, I'm going to, to operate. But, you know, at, mm -hmm. at six, he's got a lot of uh, life ahead of him. So mm -hmm. I hope so. So just what I was going to add is, you know, something, you know, a CT myelogram is, is, a, is a good test because they're kind of putting that contrast agent, that, that dye, if you will, mm -hmm. kind of into the space where the spinal fluid flows. And so we, we can see these pretty easily on a, on a CT myelogram. 
Um, but I think, you know, before considering any sort of surgery for him, um, we would want to do an MRI. We'd want to actually see what that spinal cord looks like. Because if there are other changes, you know, that mm -hmm. suggest that maybe there is long-term kind of damage there, that may also kind of tip, tip the scale a little bit. Um, yeah. And so you can get a better assessment of, of kind of the, the entire spinal cord and see that, that diverticulum as well. And so at least, you know, for me personally, that, that is something that I would want to have before going in. Do you, do you know what, what area of the spine, what kind of level they, they said it was at? Um, I do. I'd have to see if I could. Well, maybe I can just put it on my phone. Okay, we tend to, to see these kind of towards the end of the, the, the rib cage, the lower thoracic spine. Yeah, I know it was all further back. I want to say mid back or lower. And um, while I'm looking this up, with this condition, I am wondering too, does it eventually always lead to full rear end paralysis, if not uh, treated with surgery? I don't know that we can say that it always leads to that. Um, you know, and again, I, I think the vast majority of dogs are actually much older. Um, and so I think a lot of times something else is coming up in, in their body, you know. Um, Dr. Wong, I, I don't know if, if you agree, I, I feel like I haven't seen a lot of dogs actually be totally paralyzed from this. Yeah, so I, I um, <clears throat> sorry, I was multitasking there. So I, uh, I usually do not see these dogs become unable to, to walk. Um, so usually they're, they're still ambulatory. In, in fairness, you know, I'm usually not following them out five, six, seven years. Um, I, I'm, I'm on a, a couple different uh, forums online where, you know, we do see these pugs that are in wheelchairs, you know, or, or, or need the, the, the drag bags and things like that. Um, but I personally haven't ever, ever seen a dog or followed a dog long enough to see that they actually, you know, are, are completely unable to walk. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I, I usually set up people that it's going to get worse, but I usually don't see them become non-ambulatory or certainly not paralyzed. Okay. Um, I did find that it says that the area was dorsal to T10. That's a very classic, classic location for these. Okay. But again, that, that doesn't necessarily change, change anything about what we would do, but it would be yeah. very to, to be able to see the spinal cord with an MRI and mm -hmm. see if there's any changes actually within the, the, the tissue of the spinal cord. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing I'm wondering too, <clears throat> are there any other treatments that can help this condition other than surgery, uh, such as acupuncture, um, laser therapy? I did try him on prednisone, on a trial of prednisone, and that didn't really seem to make a difference, but it was only for a month. So I guess I'm wondering if there's anything else too that might help. You know, Dr. Wong had kind of mentioned it before that, you know, a lot of the, these guys are on steroids and get physical mm -hmm. therapy and we don't necessarily see much change. You know, laser and acupuncture tend to be more geared towards, you know, painful conditions. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure how much of an effect those would have on, on for Max, but you know, mm -hmm. I'm I definitely like physical therapy. I think it helps kind of maintain um, their you know their strength as much as possible. So, mm -hmm. but other actual medications, I, I can't say that that we have anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I think a lot of those are. I, I guess I think to myself, knowing what these spinal cords look like, you know, having seen them at surgery, having seen them on the on the MRI, I, I guess I have a hard time saying, you know, is what's going to take away that scar tissue, that, that fibrous band, um, you know, from a medication standpoint. And uh, mm -hmm. so it, I guess it's hard for me to, to di digest how one of those treatments would actually fix the underlying cause. Mm -hmm. Are they going to hurt anything? You know, typically not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I typically recommend things like the physical therapy for them because I, I think even if it's not helping the underlying problem, if it's helping all of the other things, um, mm -hmm. all of the other strength and flexibility and things like that, it's, it's mm -hmm. certainly going to help. Um, okay. Um, and one other question I have too, in regards to any um, neurological issue with French Bulldogs especially, because I've seen this in, um, on the message boards and everything, everyone talks about it. They all say that an MRI has to be done 
to fully diagnose any of these conditions. And um, the reasoning behind us getting the CT with the myelogram is because that was all that was available at the vet that we were at. They didn't have an MRI machine and I'd been there before. It was a, a trusted vet and um, this is during COVID. So um, the other emergency vet in the area that does have an MRI machine would only see Max if he declined and was unable to walk or in severe pain. So they were only taking emergency cases. So that was our reasoning behind getting the CT with the myelogram, but other people asked to just, is an MRI necessary? Um, I, I'm pretty sure nothing can be seen on an X-ray in regards to this really. So I'm sure other people are wondering too, can a CT be done or would you recommend always skipping that and going right for an MRI? Go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right in saying that an X-ray would you would never see this on an X-ray. Um, and you know, could we see potentially um, like a, a malformed vertebrae on an X-ray? That's that's definitely. Um, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with you having gotten um, that particular test, a CT myelogram. Again, it, it is it is still a very good test. Um, with you know the reason that sometimes we you know we do recommend MRI over CT is you know dogs. Let's say with IVDD. You know, a lot of dogs will have kind of chronically bulging or what we call mineralized discs. And on a CT, they, they may look bad, but if a, and if in a disc kind of acutely ruptures, we may or may not see that depending on how mineralized that disc is. So we don't want to miss a lesion and potentially do surgery on the wrong spot. Um, so that's why MRI is, you know, tends to kind of be the, the gold standard for looking for spinal problems because not only does it give us you know, all the information with, with the bones and the, the cartilaginous structures, you know, the discs, um, we, you know, it's always so important for us, especially as neurologists, to, to see that spinal cord and, and see what it looks like. And, and um, you know, unless there is a very large, you know, like tumor inside of the spinal cord, we may miss that on, on CT. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. But you know, you, you got you got a, a lot of information out of that, so mm -hmm. you know, don't don't feel bad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think as it pertains to to Max, um, you know, if I would say I haven't seen the CT myelogram, but if mm -hmm. the, the the spinal arachnoid diverticulum is actually one of the conditions that we actually can see really well on a CT myelogram, um, mm -hmm. so there there are other conditions that you know. Where we're talking now for Max is we've got a diagnosis, um, but for other people, like your question was, you know, that don't have a diagnosis yet, yeah, that's why we recommend MRIs because you might not luck out and find it on a CT myelogram. So that's, yeah. I'm just repeating what Dr. Seneca just said, but for, from Max's standpoint, um, you know, I, I, I don't, assuming the, the CT myelogram that you have shows a obvious subarachnoid diverticulum or spinal mm -hmm. arachnoid diverticulum. And I, I don't think you should feel bad that you didn't do an MRI. I think you've got an answer. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think you necessarily need to run out and get an MRI just to, to, to prove it. Yes, would it mm -hmm. add some additional information? Yes. For, for what it's worth, usually for me, if, if I've got a dog that I'm suspecting this, so based on the history, you know, a French bulldog with a six month history of um, non-painful progressive wobbly walking and fecal incontinence, um, you know, many times it's already on my radar that we might be finding this condition, the spinal arachnoid diverticulum. And many times I'm telling those owners, I'm going to do an MRI first. If I find a spinal arachnoid diverticulum, I'm actually going to do a CAT scan, not a CAT scan myelogram, but a CAT scan as well, because I like to look at the, the bony structures. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but in Max's case, I wouldn't run out and go get an MRI now in okay. addition, because I don't think it's going to change mm -hmm. anything unless you're strongly considering, you know, something surgery. like surgery. Yeah, and I think I am considering it more now than I was before. I just am not sure if there is someone in this area that is familiar with it, so. Um, the neurologist I saw in Madison that did confirm the diagnosis and she did recommend an MRI as well. She did talk about surgery, but said that it is not done very often and there's not much known about it. And it's kind of a questionable surgery. So that kind of, she basically said an MRI will 
give us more information and really confirm things for us, but it's not really going to change anything. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we all kind of agree with that. It's, you know, we, we do hernia disc surgeries every single day. And, you know, these, they are just a little bit more, more rare. And so we don't have the, the sheer numbers, but behind it to, to be able to give people like a lot of statistics where, you know, with, with hernia discs, we know, we know pretty confidently, you know, the, the percentages of dogs that are going to get better versus not. All right. Well, do you have any other, any other questions for Max? Um, I'm sure I could come up with a bunch more, but I think that that covered a lot of what I was kind of wondering about, just the difference between IVDD and this, and as far as surgery and treatment goes. So, yeah, I think I think it was very helpful. Thank you both. You're very welcome. My my hope is, you know, I, I mean, it's one of these catch twenty twos where we have to say, well, gosh, we don't know a lot about it, and we don't do a lot of these surgeries. Um, you know, but that kind of leads to, I mean, I, I, I own a pug, so I think about this often, um, of, of, of would I do surgery or not, and especially if it was phrased to me, you know, in the way that it is, and we need to be honest, just we don't do a ton of them, we don't see it nearly as often as a slip disc, and it's not as much of a, a slam dunk that we're going to fix it like a slip disc, um, but that sort of leads to, well, we just don't do the surgery as often, which leads to when we're when we meet the new person with it, we still have to say, well, gosh, we don't do them a lot. So my, yeah. my hope is, you know, in the future, uh, we'll we'll have more studies, more experience, and you know, mm -hmm. and, and and better, stronger outcomes where we can say to a client, you know, yes, there's an 85% chance that your dog's going to do great mm -hmm. with surgery, but only a 50% chance if we do medications, and you know, so mm -hmm. but. We're, we're not there yet. Yeah, exactly. For what, it, for what it's worth, it's definitely been a topic of discussion. I think at a conference a few years back, you know, where this was a, uh, a discussion that, that we had as a group. So, you know, we're, we're thinking about it and hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, I hope so too. Okie dokie. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Bye, um, Max. <laughs> Bye, Jane. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. How are Perfect. you? Perfect. Gus, Gus definitely just heard you too. <laughs> Gus, you have a tough life. It's extremely tough. This is what he does pretty much 24 <laughs> 7. He's very spoiled. When, when you first got on, he was kind of stretching and. Yep. The sprayer sprawl. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, 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 what kind of, well, how, how old is Gus and uh, what's going yeah. on with him? So I rescued Gus in April. He is five years old. He's a Springer Spaniel. Um, he is the most perfect dog. He's came when I originally got him with no health issues, clean bill. Um, I had him for about a month. And after a month, there was one night where we had been gone um, on vacation for a weekend. I came back home and we were sitting on our, my couch and he had jumped off the couch and was picking his back legs up really funny. And that was like my first indicator. I was like, oh, like what's going on? And he, it was kind of like almost like a muscle spasm. Like his body contorted inwards. He was like shaking a little bit and like I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Um, and brought him to the vet and he tested positive for urachia um the tick-borne xenos disease i might be butchering that name <laughs> we got but, you. um so we, he was put on doxy for that we thought it was related to that um and he's had afterwards like several very similar episodes um to which then my vet determined that they were likely seizures um and so he was put on 500 milligrams of potassium bromide which he responded really well to um and just like kind of describing the episodes, um, he's very responsive. So I can talk to him, he can understand my commands. I can like pat the bed and help him try to jump up on the bed. Um, I can tell him to like walk to me and he'll like come walk to me. Um, but it generally starts with him picking his back legs up really high and kind of funny. Um, and then it typically, the next step is then like he like lifts one of his front legs in the air, like kind of straight in the air and then he'll like contort his body inwards. And then sometimes he'll shake a little bit. Um, 
but again, like very responsive, um, typically lasts only like a minute or two. And so when he was put on the medication in May, he hadn't had any episodes. We were really lucky. Like he responds really well to medication. I really didn't see any negative side effects. Um, and then within the last week, he's had two episodes um, within a week span. And trying to kind of figure out like if it's the potassium bromide level, um, what could be related or what like triggered the seizures, um, trying to figure that out. But so we've upped his medication now. He's taking a thousand uh, milligrams and we're gonna try that for a couple months to see if we can bring his potassium bromide level to a therapeutic level. Um, but I guess like one thing I've noticed too, and I'm not sure if this is related and if you've seen this in seizure patients is that I've seen I've been trying to like keep track of any behaviors I've noticed um, that's different. I've noticed a lot of like teeth scattering. So sometimes he will like come, he like always puts his head right on my chair and his like bottom lip will, lip will kind of quiver a little bit. Um, and I noticed it once and like didn't really think twice of it, but then now I've noticed it a little bit over the past month and not sure if that's related to whatever condition he has. So I guess like the, what he's currently diagnosed as is like just idiopathic epilepsy. Um, I think I said in the chat that um, I'm in like the canine seizure support groups on Facebook. Um, actually, that's how I found you guys. And I really enjoy watching these webcasts. Um, but some people who have dogs that have CPD, canine, I'm not going to probably not be able to say this, canine, perioximal, dyskinesia. I don't know if I butchered that. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. I, I usually have a hard time saying it too. So <laughs> I'm an accountant, so I definitely cannot say anything medical. But paroxysmal dyskinesia. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I've seen videos of dogs um, that have been diagnosed with that, and it almost looks identical to Gus. Um, so I don't know if that is like potentially what he has. Um, and I guess like my questions for you all is: Are you familiar with CPD and I guess I kind of have a hard time understanding like what the difference between that is and idiopathic epilepsy um, and just like treatment plans or just any thoughts you guys may have based on all that. No, that was a lot. <laughs> so just a quick question. Did, did a bromide level in his blood actually get checked before making this change? Um, not before making the change, no. But the last time, so I should have mentioned, so he was on the medication for a month um, in May. And then originally we had thought that maybe it was related to his urichia. And so we tried taking him off the medication to see if he was doing fine, if he would have a seizure. Um, and he, within like a couple days, like he got one. So we put him right back on the medication. But at that moment, they did test his blood level and his potassium bromide level was really low. Um, and so that's the only like, Thing that I could, I mean, I'm not a vet. That's the only thing that I can think of that could have changed. Like he hasn't really had a change in diet. Um, he's on a from white fish and potato diet. Um, he like gets a couple just like supplements, like joint supplements and salmon oil. Um, no changes in exercises. So I don't know what could have triggered the seizures. And, and it was just the fact that two happened within a week and he hadn't had any in two months. Um, was why I brought, I brought him to the vet on Monday. Um, and that's when they said they would try up in the medication to see if that helps. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So, you know, when you were describing these episodes, seizure, you know, yes, it's definitely possible. And we can see uh, what we call generalized seizures, which is kind of like the, the typical classic presentation of loss of consciousness. They're, mm -hmm. you know, kind of on their side, they're paddling, they're foaming, they're losing their, their bowel or their urine. But but not every dog reads that textbook. And so we can also see what we call partial seizure activity. Um, and, and kind of very often when it's partial seizure activity, um, the dog may be conscious and perhaps their seizure is kind of a rhythmic movement of one limb or, or they're mm -hmm. blinking one eye or twitching one ear. Um, mm -hmm. So what you're describing is, involves a, li a little bit more of the body. Um, so, so sure, this, this could be seizure, but the paroxysmal dyskinesia you know, that's what we call a movement disorder. And movement disorders are, are very, very challenging to, to definitively diagnose. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as treatment goes, um, we definitely are limited. So, you know, putting him on seizure medication is definitely not wrong um, because some of them, some of these dogs will respond to, to anticonvulsant medications. 
um, bromide in particular, uh, it's just a very slowly acting drug. Um, okay. So perhaps the, the level was very low when you checked it because it can take a few months for that even to become therapeutic in their bloodstream. Got it. Um, and so, uh, and there is kind of a pretty wide safety margin of dosing. And so it, it will be interesting to know um, kind of where that level gets to. You know, I, typically we, we like to check um, a, a level about a month after if, if you make okay. a change. So, so that would be good to know. Um, but as far as, you know, diagnosing it, a lot of it just depends on, you know, kind of depends on what the owners are describing and what we're seeing, you know, in video recordings and things like that. Yep. Um, and, you know, their response to, to seizure medication. Yeah. Um, I guess like going off of that, have you seen any dogs like with like that teeth chattering movement? Like it's like his, like, it's his bottom lip like quivers. And I don't know if it's related to it at all. With, with uh, okay. a movement disorder, you know, with, with any sort of teeth chattering and things like we always want to make sure there's nothing in the mouth that's actually causing pain because that's yeah. very often a sign of oral pain in dogs. Um, we can see fly biting seizures. Um, yeah. and often that's that's a more kind of dramatic movement of the of the mouth than just a, a quiver of a lip. So I don't, Dr. Wong, I don't know if you have anything else to add to, to the to the little chattering there. Oh, from the chattering standpoint, yeah, I mean, it, is, is it kind of when he yawns or? No, so he does yawn quite a bit, but as you can see, he sleeps all the time. So I think that's probably has to do with the yawning a little bit. Um, but it's mostly when he's like coming up to me, like he'll, and every time he has an episode, like he is like on top of me. Like I can tell it's coming because like, I think he starts to feel it and he just like finds comfort in being with me. Um, yeah, it's not when he's yawning, like it's his, when his mouth is closed, it's like just the bottom lip. And the good thing was I was able to get a video of it this week. So I sent it to our vet. Um, I haven't heard back from them. Um, but yeah, we're like right now, we haven't seen a neurologist. Um, I'm still just going to like our family vet. So like definitely thinking down the road, that's probably like what I wanna do. Um, just cause like, even just like listening to these calls, like I feel like I learned a lot more from hearing from you guys. Um, but yeah, like he's responding well to medication, like he does not have any negative side effects from it, which we're really lucky about. And like 99% of his life, he's great. It's just those couple minutes every month or so that we've experienced, um, these episodes. So, um, from the teeth chattering standpoint, I mean, that, that, I, I feel like I, I see that a lot and it's not an actual, you know, pr problem, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I usually don't find an underlying brain problem, nerve problem, muscle problem, pain, et cetera. Um, and I, for lack of a better term, I usually don't know what it means. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, we, I, I also just don't see a lot of these, you know, movement disorders or the, the, the CPDs. Um, it's, it's, I guess, a little bit more reported in certain breeds, you know, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, they've got their, their kind of classic thing that they do. And um, the, the border terriers with the, yeah. uh, the, the, the gluten diets, um, the, the gluten allergies. Uh, I, I'm not aware of, of anything in Springer's, um, but I don't know if you can help me there, Dr. Seneca. Um, yeah, I agree. And I mean, Springer's are certainly a breed that we see epilepsy in. And yeah. that's what makes this very tough. We have a breed who we see a lot of seizures in, um, but what you described definitely sounds kind of movement disorder. -y. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, like uh, considering how well he's tolerating the, the bromide, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it is worth continuing that, you know, some, some, there's yeah. some argument that maybe Keppra or Levetiracetam may work a little better for some dogs yeah. disorder. So that's another, another option down the road, depending on how, you know, what the frequency is. I mean, the, the good thing in, with movement disorders is they tend not to really impact the dog's, you know, well-being. Um, yeah, no, he's like running around after he has an appetite afterwards, he drinks water. It's like, it happens, and then it's like totally back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, we're extremely fortunate that, like I said, we it doesn't happen often, and he responds well on vacation, and he lives a very happy life most of the time. Um, I guess just like as his mom, I just like always want to know like what's going on, and like trying to figure out triggers and see if I can get sort of my idea of like when it can happen. Cause like the other thing is I live in Charlotte, North Carolina and the weather has been changing. Um, 
that's the only thing I could think of like environment wise that would be different. I don't know if that is a common trigger for dogs. Um, don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's a common trigger, no. Uh, you're saying for seizures or, or for the... Yeah, uh, or just in general. That's the only thing I could think of that's really been different in his day-to-day. -day. Uh, I mean, that, that's kind of a common and, and natural thing to, you know, just when your dog does something different, whether it's a seizure, whether it's a movement disorder, to start looking, yeah. to start looking at all of the things that have changed. And um, it usually isn't something like that. It yeah. usually isn't the phase of the moon or the... Yeah, um, <laughs> that was yeah, really all I had. I mean, you, you've got great neurologists in North Carolina, so. Yeah, I know. I was actually told about, I think it's someone at CARE. Um, I forgot his yeah. name, but Fred. I actually Fred just got Winninger. recommended. Yeah, what was the name? Yeah. Fred Winninger, go, 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 go see him. His Sounds good, I'll tell him you guys sent me. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah, he's lives a very, very easy life. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't moved. He's a spoiled, he hasn't. No, this is what he does, and I, I'm on, video calls all the time and he just sits there and people think he's a stuffed animal. <laughs> he's a character. All right. Awesome. Well, well thank you guys. Care. Best of luck. Thank and you. Really appreciate it. Awesome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he's like, nope. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Thanks, Jane. Oh, bye-bye. Do you have anything else? All right. One more. Uh, so common question that we seem to, to get a lot, um, question about rosemary extract and seizures. Is it something I need to avoid with my guy who has idiopathic epilepsy? Oh gosh, I honestly haven't had anybody ask me about rosemary, so. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure where it comes from. The, the, the short answer um, is, is I don't think it's something that you need to um, avoid because it's, it's something that's in lots of foods and um, there's there's uh, li little to zero evidence that suggests that it causes seizures or uh, exacerbates seizures. Uh, um, I I have made that recommendation all of zero times to avoid rosemary, but um, it's certainly on the internet and, and, and in forums, and um, I'm, I'm sure someone in some forum is cursing me right now, but. Uh, uh, I, I, I do not currently have the evidence um, nor personal experience to, to recommend against it or change diet or take it out of the diet. It's so interesting, like nobody has ever asked me about rosemary extract. I, I'd say it's only been over the last six months, um, but I, I, I was the same way as you the first time and I looked it up and um, you know, very, very strong feelings uh, on, on, on the internet. Um, thanks for hopping on today. And uh, I hope you guys get busy up there, stay busy up there. I'm not sure what the, the rest of today looks like for you, but uh, we'll chat soon. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.